Hello everyone, good evening. Um, you're welcome to um you're welcome to in crypto community AMA. And this week we have a special guest. Uh, thank you guys for coming so early. We always try to be as early as possible. Um, please take note that this meeting is recorded. Uh, make sure that you're on mute at all time. Um, to ensure that we have quality, um, a quality recording for those people who will not be around. Yeah, a lot of people have requested for the recording of this video, of this um, webinar. So, um, as you all know, I, my name is Tujukaka. Uh, before I make an introduction of our guest and invite him, uh, I just want to um, give some time for um, the latecomers to join us, uh, but we're not we're not going to spend more a lot of time. We're just going to start because time is of the essence. Uh, okay, yeah. If you can hear me, please just signify by saying something in the chat room. Just signify. Say something in the chat room, just give me an hello. Yeah, if you can hear me, just give me an hello on the chat. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Yusuf. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, guys, Today is all about DeFi. Um, uh, I'm excited about today's meeting because, um, because of the quality of information that we are going to be getting. Um, so, and that's because of the quality of the resource person that we have today. Um, I would like to give, it, give us a brief um, introduction and then I'll invite him and, and give him the floor. So Mr. Loki Wakwe is a renowned blockchain advocate and Africa's lead authority on blockchain and cryptocurrency. He's the author of DeFi for All. He is a member of the core, core team of YF2, um, which offers um, products in aggregate liquidity, provision, leverage trading, auto market, automated market, Nikin is the CEO of Sabi Exchange. You know, if I keep calling his portfolio and his accolades, we're not going to we're not going to leave this place. So um, let's just start, um, Mr. Lucky. Thank you so much for taking out time um, to be with us today. I understand that you are on a tour of Africa. <laughs> You know, uh, thank you very much for taking out time to be with us today. Um, over to you. Can you just give us a brief introduction of yourself about your tour, what you're doing, and where you are? Okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, guys, and thanks you. Um, thanks to Tojo for giving me the opportunity to share part of my knowledge today as well. I'll be learning again from the rest of us too as well. 
Uh, my name is Lucky, just as Tojo have introduced earlier. And um, currently in um, Nairobi, as I speak, in East Africa, doing some bits of tour already late for us in the night here. And um, just doing some tours around some couple of countries in the past two months around uh, just to explore bits of the business opportunities in this other part of the world. Um, that has been the case for me. Uh, but uh, beside that, everything around blockchain, everything around crypto, everything that has to do with decentralization has always been a part of. And um, it's been super great uh, to be here. It's uh, super great to be here. It also offers me another opportunity to be part of something um, quite unique. Um, per se, especially when it comes to the area of decentralized finance, especially when it comes to the area of open finance, as we were calling it in the initial time. But uh, I believe I will be able to share a bit of that knowledge with you today while we uh, proceed. So it's, it's a pleasure being here. Thanks to you and for the entire community. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, so excited to hear from you. I, I, I failed to mention that um, he is also the advisor of standard protocol. Um, we're going to be learning about that today as well. So uh, have your pen and paper ready. It's gonna be a fun time. All right, so um, let's get right on to it. Uh, Mr. Lockie, uh, you are the king of DeFi and NFT in Africa. You know, so I wanted to give us, I wanted to give us like your own royal definition of DeFi and tell us like in, in a very layman way, why is DeFi so important to us? What is DeFi and why is DeFi so important to us, especially as Africans? Okay, um, actually the concept of decentralized finance is as old as almost like the 20, before even the 2017 bull run of cryptocurrency. Actually, decentralized finance started um, a bit more as a concept from the Ethereum, MakerDAO. We, we, we all learned about the uh, the fork that the the hack that took place on Ethereum in 2016, but actually that hack was really something that disrupted decentralized finance. So decentralized finance ought to be as old as 2016 as a concept. That was even the original thing Maker uh, the Maker DAO wanted to um, build in 2016 before that hack that took place and they exploited Ethereum and all those kind of um, stuff. So uh, decentralized finance is not even a today's concept, but it's just that it became a bit popular um, today. So in 2016, it, it, this was like already a conversation, but at that time, when it, it was not really mainly known for decentralized finance. We're referring to it more as open finance, um, a bit more. However, the, despite the hack, the team behind um, DAO, uh, the MakerDAO did not really go to bed. They actually continued to build until about 2018 when they came back a bit more stronger. And since then, I'm, I started my own um, deep conversation around DeFi. But I know while I was discussing a bit around DeFi in Africa, few persons were um, really paying attention because I guess people were more focused on the fury of the other part of the industry around blockchain and all those kind of stuff. But uh, decentralized finance, like I said, is simply, uh, DeFi is what is called for short, but for full, it's called decentralized finance. It's just simply um, um, a financial product or a service that is, uh, that is built to be, meant to be trustless in terms of um, uh, financial related services, whether it's lending, whether it's borrowing. So it's, it's almost like mimicking exactly what the banking service would have offered you, but this time on a much more, um, open or decentralized manner, where custodianship, uh, where central control will not be put in the hands of any individual. Yes, I know that has been the mantra to which blockchain technology um, have been pushed down to the entire world. But DeFi as it is, is actually the right uh, product that talks about um, building services in terms of um, open financial products out there to anybody without necessarily still have some sort of central con um, control or some sort of centralization in the um, in DeFi. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic one. So uh, I, I could get a lot of things from what you've said so far. And yeah, but but there's something that that, that I, st I still want you to like, like betray for us. Like, um, 
like the, there's something you said you said um lending like what how can someone like uh, the average nigerian relate to DeFi? okay what so, uh, is DeFi solving for the average nigerian okay so now uh, again uh, a bit back to the definition of um DeFi, i say uh, a lot of persons actually right now um don't know that decentralized finance is actually a movement. Um, uh, hi, smart. Okay, a, a lot of persons don't actually know that decentralized finance is actually a movement. Um, people still think that um, this thing is just some sort of hearsay. I know um, the incidents we, we we begin to see in some countries, which should be a wake up call for a lot of persons, uh, where people uh, are not even guaranteed of where their resources and money will be tomorrow if it will ever be ever become valuable if you're no longer in good time with the government. For me, decentralized finance is actually much more than a product or a service. It's really a movement. But I know maybe um, two years later, we, a lot of persons will get to realize um, my concept of when I see this is actually a movement because um, um, it, it's really a response from the people back to the um, traditional financial system around um, our displeasure for what is currently existing, not just from the concept of Nigeria, not just from the concept of Africa, but this is a global kind of um, phenomenon right now where people are totally not so satisfied in terms of how government around the world have handled people's finances um, across the globe. But now coming back to your question, around how do we, if I'm not mistaken, I might want to take it again, but uh, the question is around how do we use DeFi for lending, correct? Is that, yes, is that yes, a question? Yes. Okay, yes, so, coming, okay, so coming back to the question of how we use DeFi for lending. Now, you know, if as a, from the concept of traditional banking system, so I'll be taking this from two perspectives, from what we know to where I think we ought to be, or from the mantra of what I support as decentralized finance. All right, so now, coming from the perspective of how lending normally work in traditional finance, um, when we take our money and we put them in the bank, which of course, um, I'm not necessarily in a position to tell anybody how or where he should put his or her money, all right? So, but when we take our money and we put them in, into banks, um, the bank normally will take those money and channel it to the right source. In this case, lending those money out, um, borrowing those money out to the people who want um, money, either through businesses or whatever means they have seen based on the category of things they have put in place as the right check and balance. But the question remains that when my money um, is placed in centralized financial institution, what happens, what happens if at all, um, they make interest from those money. Obviously, I, I've never seen any tra um, traditional banking institution that will ever give you the real value for what your money is worth, even though they take that money to borrow, uh, for, to lend it out to other people, or, or even borrowing it out, or whichever case um, of the divide they fall into. I've never seen any traditional uh, financial institution that give back to the people who actually made this possible. It's just like us accusing Facebook of utilizing our contents, marketing our uh, data, um, selling off all this information and they make all the money and they never get to give us the user or the people who make Facebook's a possibility as of today. So coming um, in the case of financial products right now, um, Nigerians all over the world, not just um, or even uh, the people all over the world, whether you're in Europe or whether you're in Africa, irrespective of where you're from, you're facing one issue or the other. For Africa, we're facing inflation. Why some part of Europe, we're facing negative interest um, lending. Many people who are living in Europe, when you keep their money, in the, when they keep their money in the bank, the problem is not that they have an inflation. The problem is that they are being charged excessively for keeping the same amount of money. So it's like putting $100,000 um, within your bank um, equivalents within your bank in Europe is almost like when you come back one year later, instead of meeting $100,000, you'll meet less than $100,000. And that's because they are charging what they call negative interest as of today. So in places like Germany, it's a bit more peculiar right now. While in, in places like in Nigeria or, or in Africa, we're seeing more of inflation eating up our money where $1 uh, today is no longer worth the equivalence of $1. So I remember starting last year, um, I think somewhere around 400 uh, naira to a dollar, and said so today it's over 500. So technically, it, it means we've lost more than 
um, far more than 20, 30% of the actual value as a result of this. So now where is DeFi coming in? So decentralized finance is giving me two things. First, the government wakes up. I, I, I think I, I dropped a post on my WhatsApp status. Imagine where the government... I'm sorry, Mr. Lucky. For, for for a moment there, I, I lost you. The network was a little bit shaky. And I and I think that point was very important. I want it to play out in the recording. He said decentralized finance gives us two things. All right. Okay. I lost okay. You. Yeah. Okay. So decentralized finance as a concept, that is DeFi yeah. for short. Yeah. Give every individual all over the world two things. The first thing it gives us, it gives us the value of custodianship. So what I mean by custodianship is you have the right to hold your money without your money ever leaving you. So technically, it means without necessarily keeping the equivalence of your money in the bank, for bankers to hold or for a bank to hold your money, you as a person have the right to hold your money. So your money actually never left your device. Your money actually never left your computer. Your money actually never left your phone or your money never actually never left whichever place you choose to store your money. So that's the first thing DeFi will give you. So if your money never leave you, it means if the government chooses to wake up tomorrow and they're no longer happy with whatever thing they feel they are no longer happy with, you are not under pressure of, um, so what happens to my money? You see, we had a case of recently, Twitter had just been banned in, in Nigeria. So imagine if all your business or all your entire digital assets were to be something that survived on Twitter, so because the government is not no longer comfortable for whatever reasons they have given, um, it means you totally have lost control of that particular resources of yours, just by government putting out a particular statement. So we are seeing the same thing can happen when it comes to people's finance, right? And I'm not seeing this kind of pattern slowing down anytime soon, not just from a Nigerian perspective, but almost from a global perspective where Every government always wants to put its citizens in check, including controlling what they do with their finances across the world. So DeFi give every individual around the world that ability to hold their assets in terms of custodianship. So it means you will make your money, you will earn your money, you will store your money in a digital form, and your money will never leave you. It's not a question of if you ever misplace your phone or if you misplace your laptop or whatever place you store them. It means even if you do misplace them, there's always a way to recover them. And even if you like be locked up um, by the government in any place, your money will never be within their reach. So that's the first thing DeFi offer any individual around the world. It's not a question of whether the money will make you profit or whether the money will, will, will make you loss. The question I'm saying is, even if you were to keep it in a traditional banking system, inflation could eat it up or negative interest could still eat it up. But whether inflation is eating it up or negative interest is eating it up, the negative part of the entire story will be if the government is no longer comfortable with you as a person or as an individual, they could still take that money away from you. It's simply by telling the particular traditional financial institution to just block access to Mr. Lucky's account, and that's it. So it's, it's, whatever you've worked for your entire life is gone because you're no longer in good times um, with the government of your own country. So that's one thing um, DeFi will give you. So that's the aspect of custodianship. The second, the second value or, or, or benefits to Nigerians, and I believe as the benefits accrues to Nigerians is the same for other people in the world. The second benefit to DeFi as a concept is that it gives you opportunity to earn full interest on what your actual value, your, your actual money is. You know, the reason why banks don't actually share profit back with the customers in reality, because when I compare what the bank make, from people's money under their custody in relation to what they give back as value for interest for what your money have earned, it's like, it's a joke. Like you hear bank declaring billions and billions in interest, but what goes back to the people who actually own the, that money at the end of the day is like, it's just a joke compared to uh, what they actually do. So now what is decentralized finance doing rightly in this case? They are not making it possible for, you know what, if you have X amount of dollar equivalents or X amount of Naira equivalents or X amount of pounds equivalents or whatever the currency you want to peg your crypto or digital assets to, you have that chance of saying, I know that my, my, my digital currency can end me interest in relation to exactly what, what um, it's meant to end me when we put it on comparison to um, the money that was lent out to somebody 
the equivalent of what the person had paid back and the interest that I, I'm going to get. So I'm pretty sure right now that there is no country in the world as of today, or let me narrow it down a bit to Africa. There's no country in Africa where a safe government um, investment scheme will give me up to double digit, most likely not. Um, Nigeria used to have a 40% interest rate um, from um, a safe asset like buying the treasury bills from the central bank, which was around 14% per annum. Uh, but as of today, I think it's probably around 5% or so, uh, or 7%, if, if it's too good enough. Um, for, while for the banks, they narrow it down to as low as even 4%, meaning they use the money to buy treasury bills from the central bank. They give you 4% and they hold the other remaining, um, if at all. But now with decentralized finance, the individual, the people, they have, we're returning back to what I call true democracy when it comes to finance, all right? So the people have the right to utilize these platforms or these services that are currently being built on most DeFi products. And they earn the real interest for what their money is worth. And at the end of the day, they are not worried. The third part of value that DeFi is offering every individual is that um, so long as I have digital assets, I no longer need to worry my head around if the bank, in quotes, will accept the value for my money. So, for example, I'm living in, a, um, in an environment, of, in this part of this country, they say this part I'm living in is a bit highbrow, or if I will want to compare it to the Nigerian audience, they say the banana island, the Victoria island kind of thing, right? Okay. So it means the way the government or the people or the bank have valued, let's say, banana island or Victoria Island is a bit different from how they would have value, um, let's say, Ikorodu. I don't know if you guys really know where Ikorodu is. All right. So it, it, it's going to be a bit different. Why? It's the same land, right? But despite it's the same land, certain um, parameters have been put in place to define what is more valuable over the other by the banks. Um, so technically, uh, in the case of decentralized finance, if I have any digital assets, be it whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum, it doesn't matter where you are holding the Bitcoin, whether you're holding the Bitcoin in your phone in Nigeria or you're holding your Bitcoin in France or you're holding your Bitcoin in London, it doesn't matter. The same value of that Bitcoin is the same everywhere. So I could use that as a collateral and I will borrow if I want to borrow money as of today. But even I was to have the same kind of assets back in a traditional financial market. The government on their own, will, um, the bank on their own will determine for me what they see as valuable in relation to where or the location where I'm holding that asset. So I might be holding the same landed property, equivalence of the same size, but because I'm holding that landed property in, let's say, Banana Island or in Victoria Island in Lagos, and I'm holding the same amount of land in, let's say, Shahara, the bank will not see both of them as the same equivalence of value. So technically, one person gets to earn more or borrow more, and the other person has to borrow less because they wow. have seen that value wow. differently. So wow. that's the third value decentralized finance is offering the people. So, Meaning, so, so if I understand it correctly, it sort of brings a, a form of equality. You know, it puts everyone on the same scale. You know, your one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin everywhere, and you correct. should have. Um, the same potential to assess the same kind of um, um, facility or credit that you know Correct. you should be able to accept. That that is really deep. That is really deep. You know those are some values that people don't actually see. You know when people think of cryptocurrency, they just think about buy low, sell high, just think about the hype and all. But there are some fundamental value that is actually um, redefining the way finance work and actually bringing a lot of competition. You know, to the financial space. You know, you know. So that correct. that's really lovely. Yeah. So correct. So 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 you can imagine where somebody is living in this village, having the same landed property. Somebody is living in the city, having the same landed property. But both people cannot be granted access to borrow the same kind of line of credit, despite both of them have the same land. Right. Yeah. So um, these are the things decentralized finance is now bridging by saying, you know what, if you have a digital asset in the five space you have the same line of credits to borrow. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you're from. And you have access to a pool of funds as of today. That's one of the benefits of decentralized finance. And the last or the fourth benefit of decentralized finance for even a local a Nigerian is that I don't need to have um, what we call government IDs. It's not everybody that have an opportunity to be given IDs. Imagine if I'm a refugee in a foreign country and I'm probably 
that I have not been given access to the government national ID. I'm limited by virtue of quote unquote um, government ID to be granted access to financial products. So if I'm a refugee, let's say in one of the refugee camps, and I need money for business, um, because I do not have a national means of identification in that country, I am totally denied the, uh, the safe financial service. Just because, not because I've done anything wrong, but because I found myself as a refugee, let's say in, a, in another country, and that's it. So decentralized finance is changing that narrative to say, whether you have a national ID, whether you have documentation, whether you don't have a documentation, whether you have the same equivalence of value of a landed property or asset, whether you um, you don't like the fact that your interest will not be given equally to you, or whether um, you feel like custodianship from the perspective of um, a central entity holding your money, you're not comfortable with any of these. DeFi tends to fill all these various gaps. And that's exactly one of the benefits DeFi offer anybody. And I'm saying it till tomorrow. It's, it is a right thing for people to begin to think around decentralized finance as of today. Looking at how the narrative is going around the world. You see, governments are now looking for how they could begin to implement central bank digital currencies. One of the negative aspects of that thing, when government begins to implement central bank digital currencies, I already know that China is a bit ahead when it comes to other countries in central bank digital currencies. The US government recently have, they begin to talk about also issuing central bank digital currency. I learned again the, um, the Central Bank of Nigeria in person of uh, uh, Godwin and Mayfield, uh, they're also discussing something around Nigerian central bank digital currencies. You know, the negative aspect to putting the entire Nigerian Naira in a digital format is that if the government don't like you, if we move all our currencies from physical paper to a digital form, all in the name of central bank digital currencies, if the government don't like you, your money is as good as not yours. It's, it's so, not. It's, it's yeah. awesome. So this is some terrible thing that people are not seeing. Yeah, that, that pe people, need to, people need to really take note of that. Yes, yes. So people are not seeing that aspect when it comes to um, um, central bank digital currencies. While it's a good thing, there is a negative side to it if the government chooses not to um, see you as being credit worthy, or if the government chooses to see you as an enemy of the state. It means whatever you're earning, whatever you're making is as good as not yours. And we've seen that actually happen in places like China, where if somebody violates certain particular um, code of conduct or whatever they see as being their rules, you're almost denied service to public infrastructure. Your credit worthiness drop, meaning it's not because you've really done some sort of serious crime, or maybe let's say you choose to put some sort of graffiti or you choose to align yourself with some sort of foreign nation, the government almost deny you access to ever use a public train. It happens in China. So if they give them, um, if they move all the digital yuan into central bank digital currencies in, in China, the government can just wake up any money and press the button. And your billions that you have, your millions that you have, they are the not <laughs> You know, I, I, this reminds me of the story that I, that I, that I heard. Um, I think it was Munachi that was talking about it. He was talking about a particular billionaire that was actually very rich, like royalty rich, the kind of um, wealth that you have lions in your compound. And I think it was in Syria, but because of, you know, politics, war, economic uh, downturn, whatever, I, don't, I didn't get the details. The guy is now driving cab in the U.S. because all his wealth, you know, is tied to the country, you know. So DeFi as an alternative edge is a big deal. You gotta have a plan because Real they can cut you off like that, you know, and 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 you're gone. And especially when we have a digital system, you need to have a plan B. All right. So you've said a lot, you know. I feel that if if we keep going about this, you know, there's so much to pour. You know, I, I want us to to take a step forward and talk about the standard protocol because I believe that is that's that's one of the projects. That's like the latest baby. You're an advisor for the project. I want you to tell us, like, uh, I, I want to use it, you know, because I believe anything you're doing, it's it's um, worth looking into, you know, because, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, that, that's that's one of the trick guys. Whenever you see those top guys, you know, those industry leaders, when they start talking about something, you want to pay attention to it because that's where, that's the future, all right? So I want you to tell us about the standard protocol, what is standard protocol, how can we get started? You know, what, what kind of value is it bringing to the marketplace? 
Okay, so um, um, thank you again for the opportunity, Tojo. Um, again, what you just said reminded me of somebody saying, if I had known that Lucky was talking about Yen Finance and DeFi yeah. in 2019, I probably would have just cashed in everything and go into Yen Finance when Lucky was doing the exactly. AMA sometimes last year. <laughs> even, even me, follow myself, no, I was right? <laughs> Follow the route. <laughs> <laughs> so even me, myself, last year, I... I wasn't really putting much in terms of digital, um, in terms of my portfolio management into some of these DeFi projects. Well, of course, I knew they were like, like the, the right thing to do us at that time. So now coming about standard protocol, standard protocol is like the newest project which I'm part of right now. So I've been made an advisor to the project, but I'm not I'm not saying this from the perspective of because I'm an advisor. I'm saying this because when I see value, personally, I I talk about projects that I feel that are worthwhile. I promote them. It's not even a matter of if I have some sort of contract with them. It's not even a matter of if I'm part of the core team, right? When I was discussing DeFi, I, I, I don't talk about them because every DeFi is a project that I'm part of. Yes, um, even starting from the likes of Yen Finance 1 or Yen Finance 2 as a community or core member of this project, I, I was discussing with about them because I, I saw that they were real value to real people, even though people might not fully understand the entire value it's offered. But Standard Protocol is one of that brainchild that I see as being one of the most innovative. I'm still most innovative for the fact that I was pretty shocked when I saw that but for the first time in the history of humanity, a project wants to adopt a tree token model system. We've never in the history of blockchain or decentralized finance or uh, distributed ledger technology hear of people talking about a tree token model system. We've, we've not heard about that. Now, um, there is a challenge that people might ask me or that people will want to know when it comes to DeFi. You see, as we encourage people or talk about people converting some of their portfolios into digital or crypto-based assets that are either stable or that are probably volatile, depending on what you're comfortable with. People can wake up also one morning after converting their local Naira or dollars into stable coins. And then after waking up, if they choose to say they want to convert it back to Naira, somebody might choose not to even give them the real Naira. There is no guarantee that says if I change my Naira to digital currency, then when Oh, I think the network is just something's wrong with the network. I want to say have come. The, the people believe that the total amount of USDT that are currently in circulation. Hello, can you hear me? Told you. Okay, I can hear you. I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, good. So people believe that the total amount of stable coins in circulation is not equivalent to the amount of dollar put in the bank. Meaning, if all of us wake up today and tell the cryptocurrency community that, you know what, every stable coin that I have, I want to change them back to my local currencies in my country, whether dollar, whether Naira, people believe that they are probably not going to be enough dollars to cover for the equivalence of that. It's just like all of us waking up today and we go to our bank and we tell our bank, give me back, take back your digital money, give me the Naira. There is a tendency that we have what they call bank run, or there's a tendency that people, uh, if you need your physical Naira today, there's a tendency that if you go back to the bank to ask for physical Naira, there's not enough Naira to go back into circulation to meet the equivalence of every uh, person's demand. But anyway, the government is hoping that at, at no point in time would all of us come back to ask for an Naira all at the same time. But the same issue is currently being faced in the cryptocurrency community, where people are saying USDT is not fully backed uh, because it's the first stable coins in the community that utilize dollars. For every one USDT that is out there in circulation, there is one dollar somewhere in a bank. Um, on a, on a peer-to-peer -peer ratio. But that's one thing around stable coin. The second part is that people also believe that 
People also believe that because it's not fully back, we're just believing that it's, it's backed and anything could happen, which is true actually on a fair fairness to the traditional bank. I know this one, they will give it a thumbs up when I'm seeing it since it favors the, the outside of the narrative, but of course I will still say it. So actually, the, the standard protocol does help to- Yes, I, I, that. I'm, driving, okay. I'm driving to that. I'm driving to that. So um, that's one thing which Teta was able to do. For every one digital currencies like or stable coins or called Teta, there's a dollar pegged to it. That is utilizing dollar to collateralize stable coin. That's one thing, but people still don't believe it anyway because they believe it's not totally backed. The second part is there's another type of stable coins that are backed by another crypto asset, more like some sort of derivative type of stable coin. In this case, we have what we call DAI. DAI is another type of stable coin that is backed by other crypto assets, meaning uh, if I if I have 100 DAI in circulation, there is, um, there is an equivalence of Bitcoin and Ethereum staked somewhere that is about 200 times of that. So there's always this 50% ratio between the total amount of DAI that's out there and whatever that is minted. Um, so these type of stable coins like DAI actually uh, even though they are over collateralized uh, according to how it's been defined, even though they are over collateralized, there is also the tendency that what if the price totally dumped in terms of the total collateral, what happens? Of course, you'll be forced to be, you'll be forced to liquidate it if you were to put them in terms, in, some, in terms of a particular DeFi project. That is another type of stable coin. So we have the first stable coin that is fiat backed, the second stable coin that is crypto backed. And we now have a third type of stable coin, which is synthetic or rebasable, meaning um, instead of backing them with some sort of crypto asset or backing them with some sort of cash in the bank, which used to say, you know what, we'll continue to increase the supply or reduce the supply as the demand for stable coin comes and go. So if I was to say, if Nigeria have a need for, let's say, 100 trillion naira, all right, we kind of means more of that. And if there's Nigeria have less need, we'll burn more from that. So technically um, doing what a project called Amplefort. So Amplefort was like the first blockchain project to apply um, um, repaisable type of, or synthetic type of um, stable coin. So the three type of stable coin are either synthetic or uh, crypto backed or fiat backed. But there is always a challenge between these three things. So what standard protocol end up doing is, can we create a hybrid of these three and create a unique solution? That's exactly what they've done. For me, that was very innovative. For the fact that I could see a, a cryptocurrency that is crypto backed, that is fiat backed, and is rebasable, gives me stronger confidence to say anywhere in any part of the world that I find myself, I'm not worried because there's something backing that particular asset. That for me is the first time in the history of the entire industry. I'm seeing somebody building a hybrid version of stable coins that fills in all the problem or challenges across these various uh, products. So these are one of the things I'm advising them on as an advisor to the project when I was onboarded um, into the entire project. That's one thing Standard Protocol have done. The second thing Standard Protocol have done in terms of the tree token model system. And what did they call that their stable coin? They called their stable coin meter just like people call their stablecoin USDT, USDC, DAI, they call their stablecoin Meter. And I like the fact that Meter is the only stablecoin right now in the world that is utilizing um, crypto, uh, some sort of crypto assets backing it up, some sort of stable uh, fiat backing it up. And it's also rebasable depending on the demand and supply, meaning you can't just mint as much as you want um, without a collateral sitting somewhere backing it up. So these are the things Meter have been able to do through standard protocol as a, as a technology concept. The second thing they've done is, now for those of us in the decentralized finance space, we deal a lot with um, automated market maker, which is what we call the AMN, all right? So it's like a place where all of us in our various houses, in our various computers, can choose to stick our crypto assets into a pool or into some sort of an exchange. Nobody have control over the exchange. All of us can choose to pull out our money when we like because the money never left our wallet in the first place. But we are just giving um, the smart contracts the right to say if there's a demand for this or based on certain conditions or parameters that have been met that you can choose to take away from some of um, these our assets that I've staked and in return you give me the other corresponding value of asset. 
Okay, so standard protocol have also looked at it and said, people of um, Uniswap, or maybe um, one inch um, as of today, all these various decentralized exchanges have, have this issue around high um, transaction fee. Apart from that, another challenge is some of these decentralized exchange fees in, in terms of what if you come back and you stake your 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 um your crypto assets in one of those lending protocols or DeFi protocols, whether Compound or Aave, and the price of crypto assets fall for like say over thirty percent? Two things: you are either forced to top up more collateral so that it will increase the value of the actual asset, or you'll be forced to the force the system would automatically force to liquidate you. But people feel that. Sometimes these false liquidations can be um, rigged or controlled in a way, if I would use that for lack of word, I use the word rig, actually. So people feel that this, um, the way to which they now sell off those particular assets is unfair. Because, you know, when the system first liquidates you, who do they sell those assets to? You're selling to somebody. Somebody's buying it elsewhere, right? So people are sometimes buying it elsewhere in an unfair price. So because the system, if you ever have tried the likes of margin, where you see that your, your position is about to be liquidated, sometimes the margin will just sell off all your assets, not sometimes on the spot price, sometimes far, far below the spot price. And you see, people get a bit pissed off with this kind of thing. So Standard Protocol looked at it and said, can we create some of our own AMM, Automated Market Maker, where even people stick into the pool, there's fairness in terms of how they liquidate or sell off their um, assets. And not just that, can somebody also take this leverage of saying, you know what, when they sell off my assets, can I come back to reclaim it later? Can I, can I say that, okay, I know you bought my asset at a pretty ridiculous cheap price, but now I've been able to get back, back some sort of uh, um, collateral to back it up. Can you return it back to me? Some sort, something of sort, but of course there's always a penalty to that, but at least it's better than you totally losing your entire asset or portfolio. And they're also trying to solve mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're also trying to solve that fairness or that transparency from automated market maker. But for every time they solve that um, particular, for every time people um, lock up their assets in those automated market maker on their decks, they give them a receipt. That receipt is what we call the proof that you own or have staked in your particular token in that particular automated market maker. In the case of decentralized finance um, or DEX products like um, Uniswap, um, we call it LP tokens, that's like liquidity pool tokens. That liquidity pool token earn you interest. For every time people buy and sell on the exchange or in the DEX, you earn interest from that particular pool. For every time um, there is a decision to be made, of course, um, the transaction fees and all that, for the fact that you're holding a liquidity pool token, you earn interest from transactions happening. It doesn't matter whether the transaction was yours or from another person, but for the fact that you're holding that particular token, you earn interest in it as per LP token. So standard protocol also having trying to solve the transparency issues and the AMM problem that come with high transaction fee. They are also saying that you earn interest as a result. You earn interest as a result of um, staking in that particular pool. You earn interest as a result of whatever transaction fee, and you also stand a chance of seeing the fairness to how who can buy whatever liquidated assets that that. Um, that happens in that particular pool. So uh, uh, what is that receipt that is given to the person for having staked their token in that pool call? They call it um, liter. Remember I said the stable coin is called meter. The next one I said is called liter. That's ML, all right? So meter, liter. So liter is that particular token you are given. For every time you go stake your assets in the pool, they give you um, another um, liquidity pool token called liter. And you can go do whatever you want to do with the liter. Of course, there's also a market for buying and selling liter, just like people sometimes demand that you can stake your Uniswap LP tokens as collateral, even in another project. It doesn't have to be just on Uniswap alone. Then the last thing they also have been able to do is that they are able to create a governance token, a token that allow people to make decisions on how they should build or in what direction they should build the product or services which they offer. Now, while they build a product or service um, which they offer, the governance token is called standard. So standard is that token that govern the entire ecosystem of standard protocol. While liter 
is that liquidity pool token that gives you interest or allow you to earn interest from being a participant in the automated market maker. Why meter is that stable coin that have solve the problem around this mistrust between stable coins or no stable coin. Is it backed or not backed? If tomorrow I wake up and I want to take or convert back my, my coins back to real cash, can I be guaranteed of that it will be converted? Yes. So these are the three things they've been able to do. For me, that is quite innovative coming from the perspective of what I knew from the industry, pers um, from what the industry was. So the first time we even saw a two token model system, was with the like of Neo. Neo, Neo introduced Neo coin and the gas, all right? This was like the first project that did a two token model system. And then of course, later some others tried to come. But having seen three, I've never seen three before. And it was a bit innovative, looking at the solutions they tried to solve um, in this case. And they are built on the Polkadot ecosystem. And everybody knows that Polkadot have been really doing pretty great work trying to solve some of the challenges that we might be facing in Ethereum. Of course, I still see Ethereum as king, even as of today, right? But newer challenges are coming on board, the likes of Binance, even Smart Chain, doing something quite a bit unique, and um, Avalanche, as the case may be. Standard protocol also utilizing the DOT or the Polkadot ecosystem. And this, so whether the person wants to earn interest, all right, or whether the person wants to also be a miner, I also forgot. Um, there's something we call mining, all right? Mining and, and, and the aspect of the other cryptocurrencies is just simply buying, getting some equipment and participating in the mining project, in the mining activities and you earn interest. But in the case of standard protocol, mining is uh, goes with the aspect of validators, just like we have them in the EOS. I think EOS made a bit more something around validators more popular, all right? So we have that concept of validators all right and um not just uh, validate but validators any reward so whether you're holding the standard protocol as a, as a coin if you put those standard protocol into being a validator so you can even be a miner at home by holding those tokens you can stick them to be a validator and you're earning interest of your token that's one you can also as well um use that standard protocol to um to stake it into the automated market maker pool and get LP tokens known as a um, liter from standard protocol. And you'll still be any interest on that particular liter as well. And apart from that, you can also, you're also guaranteed of a much more stable um, coin. So it's like standard protocol is a bit like a money spinner. By the time we're done building out the entire um, concept of what the founder, Mr. Khan, had imagined in his head. So if Mr. Khan's products become totally live, I think it would be like one of those money generating kind of concept for me, because when I'm holding the standard protocol, I could stake them to end um, some sort of interest as a validator, or whether I'm utilizing the same token and sticking it into a pool under the AMM, I could earn interest from the LPs, all right? So these are the things um, they've been able to achieve as of today. And there is actually more to come. The beautiful part of that is that they've shown interest in terms of Africa. And having gotten me on board into the entire project and being also an African, I saw it as a very quite innovative thing. It's, it's, it's like a launching pad for most programmers or developers who could come in and join in right now. Of course, they are, they are calling out on programmers, they are calling out on developers to join in. And the pay is quite good, sincerely. I think um, if, I'm, if I'm to be somebody who will commit more of my time into um, develop, uh, being a developer or a programmer, Standard Protocol offer me that very good opportunity for the fact that I have the chance to learn something quite new, a trip token model system I've never seen before in the world, for the fact that also the pay to be a developer within the community is quite, quite a very great incentive. Don't ask me how much I was paid to be an advisor. <laughs> All right, don't ask me how much I was paid to be an advisor in the team, but it's really super it's really super good from our perspective. And they've shown interest into wanting to build that bridge. But the beautiful part of what we're trying to build now is to connect more of the Asian market and the African market together. Not just from the Asian market, but I think from a global perspective. But uh, we've not had that corridor for easy payments between Asia, Africa, back and forth. And I think they are looking at tapping into that aspect. And if there is anybody or any African who wants to benefit from this. Sincerely, it's very important that you follow the development 
um, pace of standard protocol. And for every common person out there, you might not be a developer, but you still want to earn interest from whatever they do. So two things, you can also be some, be some sort of um, a staker. Staker, like I just said, is like a validator. Um, simply, you're, you get some standard protocol as a token. You don't know how to code. You don't know anything about programming, or you have the standard protocol coin. You can just stake it into um, the AMM once it goes live. But as of today, though, there's a pool that has been created under Uniswap. ETH standard protocol type of pool right now. So, but when the AMM of standard protocol itself goes live, you can also stake some of your standard protocol token and you'll be earning interest. So it's like saying, I have money and my money is generating me money as a result of standard protocol. I could do that. I remember people were doing that in Dash. Dash coin was like one of the first projects that made that concept to be popular through master node and all those kind of stuff. I know people who had Dash and they are thousands and they just take it just as a master node and that's it. So you are earning interest uh, with your token. You have your token, you can sell your token. Anytime you choose to sell your token, um, it's money for you. But if you don't want to sell your token, you can stick it or lock it up in the entire pool and it's generating interest. That interest, you can choose to spend it um, as you want. So for me personally, even when the AMM is gone, uh, have gone live, I intend to stick lots of standard protocol token. So I, I just become some sort of residual income for me. So I don't need to work actually. I could just, whatever interest is any, that comes from it, I use it to just sustain myself. That's one way to which even if you're not a developer as an African, you can earn interest from that. That's the second part. The third part is uh, there is some sort of reward going on that will be going out for a lot of evangelists. So when you talk about standard protocol to your community, um, hopefully to do my talk about this later, all right? So when you talk about standard protocol to your community, be it as an individual, something like that, creating content and all this kind of stuff, there's a reward also that comes from for you. So if you're a good content creator, if you're somebody who's willing to talk about standard protocol to your small community of people or your friends and of course they're willing to try it out uh, or if you're somebody who want to stake your standard protocol or if you're a developer or a programmer it doesn't matter your category there's always something for you with standard protocol and we also hope to set up an office within the african market so meaning technically people will be employed as well when this office is set up um it's, it's an ongoing discussion which i'm having with the entire with the, with the team um as of today but decisions of course will be made there's always something for people to benefit from People will become um, managers in these communities. People will become um, an African rep. Today, uh, my role is an advisor. Actually, I'm kind of, because of lack of not having an individual who is managing the African community, uh, my, uh, as an advisor, I'm just like I'm standing in also when other teams have been set up fully well. So I intend to look at other Africans who have interest or passion for this industry. Let them continue to manage. There are opportunities out there for my people, of course. There's no, there's nothing um, bad with sharing that um, to them. So yeah. we, we intend to set up regional offices across Africa for standard protocol and people, of course, will be employed for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. 